Hi, my name is Tracy Edwards and I skip with the first all female crew in the Whitbread Around the World race. It always makes me laugh when people say sailing career uh, because it's kind of been more of a jumbled mess of moving from one project to another. Um, but I was expelled from school when I was um, 15 years old and my long-suffering mother thought it might be a very good idea for me to go backpacking uh, around Europe, which at the age of 16 as I was at the time, which I think was very brave of her, but she knew I needed to go and find whatever it is I was looking for after a quite troubled uh, teenage years. Um, ended up working in a bar in Greece. Guy came in one night and said, would you like to be a stewardess on my charter yacht? And I sort of said, yes, yeah. so I was 17 at the time. And then was just so lucky to, I felt I'd really found across, found my path, if you like, and sort of stumble across sailing and knew within a few days this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So um, by the time I was 21, um, I just started doing a bit of racing and finding out what that scene was all about. And then ended up doing the 85, 86 Whitbread Around the World race on a boat called Atlantic Privateer with 17 pirates. So sailing around the world on Atlantic Privateer was an experience. I didn't have that much, well I had no ocean racing experience, I had a lot of ocean miles under my belt with a lot of deliveries and cruising. But this was a whole new kettle of fish and very different again from the small boat around the boys racing that I'd done in Sardinia and the Swan Worlds and all those other things. The guys did not appreciate having me on the boat to start off with, even though they were friends. Um, you know, they were very clear that we, we're not going to be the only professional ocean racing maxi with a girl on board. But I kind of wangled my way onto the boat and I, I spent really, I think, probably the first leg um, trying to prove myself that I wasn't going to do something stupid or fall over the side and uh, um, you know the, the, the cooking was dreadful because freeze-dried food was dreadful then there was nothing, <laughs> nothing I could do about it but what happened during the race was when we won the second leg coming into New Zealand um, and beat uh, NZR Enterprise by seven minutes after a really close uh, match race down the coast of New Zealand closest finish at that time I think everyone felt that I earned my place on board and I began to be accepted a lot more. So as we were getting to the finish of the 85-86 race, I knew obviously that you know there were 230 people in this race and we'd all become very close. And there were four girls, which just seemed crazy because this was just so much fun. And I remember thinking that even though the guys had accepted me on Atlantic Privateer, it was very much on a one-off basis. So yeah, okay, you can sail around the world, but girls can't really. So I thought, well, we're not going to get anywhere with getting girls on boats and getting out there and enjoying this, this fantastic racing, unless we change something. So I came up with the idea of an all-female crew, really to prove once and for all, you know, the girls can sail around the world and we can sail just as well as the guys. And of course, this is a marathon, it's not a sprint. So the whole strength issue, um, you know, is, is not so, important. Having then announced it, the reaction was a little bit different uh, from the yachting press and various other great ocean racing sailors uh, who took the mickey out of me, laughed at me and uh, some pretty horrendous stuff in the press, in the yachting press. We're all good mates now though. And it was, I guess, the shocking thing as I look back now is that it was kind of accepted and I didn't really think anything of it. When Bob Fisher wrote a tin full of tarts, you know, we just went, oh well. Whereas of course now you could never get away with saying that. So, you know, obviously those kind of things have changed uh, in the years since. The disadvantage for us was that people thought we couldn't do it. So we were so over-prepared. We were, you know, the training we put in, everything we did was to prove once and for all that, that women could do this. And we felt very strongly that if we didn't do it this time, the next all female crew would have an even a bigger hurdle to climb. So, you know, we just threw our hearts and souls into it and went off and did the whip bread with various people. I think the yachting press were in a bar taking bets on how far we'd get. I think the, no one thought we'd get to the end of the first leg. Um, we did, we came third, which we were gutted about and everyone else was really excited that we were still alive. And then off into the Southern Ocean on the second leg, we were probably the most determined we'd ever been to do anything. We knew this was our leg, Maiden's a heavy boat, and we were very set up for nasty weather. We went very far south, I think the furthest south of the whole fleet. 
and we won the leg coming into Australia. Coming into Fremantle first, you know, collective jaws dropped, which made us very happy. The next leg, I mean, it was people said it was a fluke, so we knew we had to win the next leg, and which is a short leg, uh, 3,400 miles from um, Fremantle to Auckland, much more of a tactical leg, which is not my area, navigation is my, uh, my thing, but two great tacticians on board, three actually, um, we had Michelle, Dawn and Mickey, and we came first coming into New Zealand, so at halfway in the race we were leading by 18 hours in our class. The scariest moment for me was going up past the Falkland Islands where I really thought there might be a chance that we would sink. We could not find where this water was pouring into the boat. Um, by the time we discovered what was going on, the uh, generator had been incapacitated, so we couldn't charge the batteries. We, the bilge pumps failed and the saying, there is no bilge pump like a, hand, like a bucket in the hands of a fright, frightened sailor, very true. Um, so we were literally bailing out with buckets. We had the floorboards up. We were desperately looking for where this water was coming in. We didn't know then it was coming through the mast, where we'd cracked the mast. We didn't know that then. And I do remember thinking, it's because I'm the skipper, everyone's looking at me and they're looking at my expression. So I'm like, ah, oh, this is fine. We'll, we'll find the leak, don't worry about it. And inside I'm going, ah, I think we might die. And I remember a conversation on the deck with Sal, because I, I can't believe I'm gonna say this, but in the days before, you know, health and safety gone mad, we had the life rafts in lockers um, in, the, uh, in the forward cockpits and to get them out you had to take the grinder handles off so that took, a, I don't know how long that would ever took because we never tried it. We didn't practice before we left. So I, said, I remember looking at Sal and going, how long do you think it would take to get the life rafts out? And she went, I'll go and find out very quietly. So she just went and did a little bit of research. Luckily, we never had to. We realised that um, it, we could empty the boat out uh, much more effectively when we were on starboard. And uh, so we, we, we literally limped up to Uruguay. But that moment of feeling very mortal and really, truly understanding the feeling that comes before you think something disastrous might happen, I've never felt that again in my entire life. I tend to put myself under a lot of pressure. I mostly do it because I'm worried that I'm not good enough. I have a really bad case of imposter syndrome. But what I know I do have is the best team. So uh, a piece of advice given to me many years ago was always make sure that you're the least experienced person in, your, uh, in the team. When you look around the room, you want to be thinking, they're all smarter than me, they're all better than me. So I made a real point of making sure, because you know, as a sailor, I'm not a great sailor. I, I think I'm a good navigator and that's my passion. But you know, I chose a team who could all sail rings around me and I did that on purpose. Because I think what I'm probably good at is managing uh, a team and um, keeping them going, keeping them motivated. So my insecurities as a skipper were quite debilitating at some points and it was, really only because I had a team around me who didn't capitalise on that, which they could have done. Um, they just wanted to make sure that I was okay, that I was, um, that, you know, that I, I felt good about what I was doing. And when we did, we learned this kind of process together and we, we sort of made it up as we went along. But I never intended to skip a maiden. I, that's, that's the thing. I was just going to put the project together and then find a skipper. And then I couldn't find a skipper. So King Hussein said to me, well, you'll have to do it. I mean, it's you kind of the skipper anyway, so just get on with it. So I kind of ended up in a role that I didn't expect. I thought I was just going to be the navigator. But, you know, when you've got a great team alongside you, you know, you can make it happen. And they did. And they allowed me to learn on the job, which is pretty extraordinary. And by the time we got uh, to the finish on the 2nd of May, which was uh, May Day Bank Holiday, 1990, we were, knew we were going to finish in second place overall, which was still an amazing achievement, we thought. And I think at that point as well, we'd realised there was a much bigger picture here, that um, we had done so much more than anyone had ever thought we could do. We hadn't done as much as we thought we could do, but, you know, it's, it's a race and things happen. Coming into Southampton at the finish was just indescribable. We... I mean, Howard, uh, Howard Gibbons, our project manager, he kind of said, oh, there's a little bit of interest. 
in the UK, you know, there's a couple of people that might think that, that you know, this is pretty cool. So we're like, okay, we knew there was going to be a boat with our family and friends coming out. So that was great. We were expecting that beautiful sunrise ghosting in towards the needles, very quiet, very calm. Really the last few moments on the boat where we realized this story was nearly over and we would all be soon having to leave each other, which was sad. So reflective moments and then we saw a boat come out and then another one and then another one and I think it was Sal who said, oh there must be a regatta on today. And then one boat turned around and came alongside us and then the next one did. And one of them had some really young children in, you know, sort of out sailing on the Solent. And, uh, you know, so I remember Sal saying to them, so, are you, are you here to follow us? And they were like, yes. And then more people turning around and then it became bigger and more. And I mean, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. And then our families came out on their boat. And then this press boat where they were all leaning over one side and this press boat was sort of leaning over like that. It was quite alarming. People throwing flowers at us. People were trying to give us food because they knew we were starving because we'd run out of food the week before, but of course we couldn't accept any outside help until we got to the finish line. And um, just the overwhelming sense of, uh, of achievement and, and all these people appreciating what we'd done. And I mean, the whole thing, I mean, I know we we're international crew, but I felt very British that day. And then this extraordinary flotilla going up the water to the point where we were like, ooh, don't want to hit anyone. And we were sort of having to give instructions to people, we're gonna attack, we're gonna jibe. Putting that spinnaker up, that beautiful Jordan spinnaker up, and those photographs of us with all the boats, I mean, they're just, um, I mean, just amazing. And then coming around the corner, I remember Michelle gave me the wheel after we'd crossed the finishing line. As we, as the gun went off, every horn in the harbour, every ship's horn went off. All the yachts around us, the horns went off. And when I look at the footage back now, you can see us all sort of doing that, and that's why. So I took the wheel and then we came into uh, Ocean Village and it was just this roar met us and it was literally, whoa! People chanting, they had Simply the Best playing with Tina Turner and that was extraordinary. <laughs> My only thought at the time was though, if I'm ever going to crash the boat, it's going to be now. <laughs> you know, just imagine the pictures, you know, not a ding all the way around. But uh, no, that was, that was amazing. And what was truly extraordinary to me was the genuine sense of warmth and joy for us and it really felt to me as if everyone was saying you know it was a real vindication for everything we'd been through to get to that point.